Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. And please use the hashtag NowChurch. Thank you, and enjoy today's service.
all over this building. Our God has been faithful. Before we move on even to the next part of this service, close your eyes, close your eyes, and just remember how good our God is to us. How faithful you are. How great he is he. Now sing it out, join them team. How great you are, my God. feel like this. Let me hear you sing it real strong. You say, my God, fill the room. Yes. Yeah. Let the airwaves know it. Let heaven and earth declare. You say, my God, oh. If you really mean it, that's a good place to give them a shout. Come on. Come on now, church, let me hear you real big. Hey, welcome back to Sunday. Come on. Isn't it good? We said, listen, for years we've been talking about, like, we own Sundays. We believe. Now, listen, that doesn't mean that we don't live for God every day of the week. Every day of the week is God's week, right? But it sure does feel good to take this moment to take back a Sunday and just worship God and start the whole week the right way. Come on. Yes. So we're glad that you are here, here in the room. We're glad that you are watching also live. We always make sure we understand that we have this campus here live, and we also have a campus of people that we love online. Let's give a shout out to everybody that is watching us. We love you. We're glad that you are here at church one way or the other. Listen, as we're coming in, listen, we're, we're continuing to, to do things and, and make sure we're being responsible with this time. And, and as you see, as you're coming in, you'll see that we have things in place to make sure we're responsible. But I want to just let you know, we're not doing that out of fear. We're doing that with faith. We move by faith. We move together as a people in faith. And that's vitally important. Remember, we're still seeing those signs and maybe we've forgotten those little yard signs there right? Faith over fear. I see them on the way and I'm like, you know, that still is a good reminder. It's always, always, always faith. Always faith. We're moving by faith. We weren't created to move by fear, people. We were not created by our God to move and be motivated by fear. So let's just believe God. Let's pray because listen, we've got a good word. I got a good word out of Isaiah and it's very clear. God says, do not fear, fear not. I, God, I have redeemed you. I called you by your individual specific name. He knows you. He called you. He's very specific about it. He said, when you go through deep waters, you're not going to drown. When you go through fire, you're not going to be burned. Fear not people because I know you. I called you. So let's pray today. Father, we thank you, Lord, that you've delivered us so many times. We've even stood as faith, believing God against hurricanes, and we've seen them turn, and we've seen them dissipate. So many times we've stood in faith at times like these, and you have showed up faithful, showed up strong. And Lord, we just bless you and we praise you that you are not going to forsake us now in this time. Lord, we thank you that as we go through this time, we'll not drown. As we go through this time, we will not be burned, Lord, by these circumstances. But Father, we believe that you've got us. You're carrying us through. Father, we thank you for healing of our land. For those that are dealing with any kind of sickness, we pray that you would heal them now in the name of Jesus. We pray that we would break, Lord, that spirit of fear off of our nation in the name of Jesus. And we pray faith and anticipation that you are a great God and you've got us for a good future in Jesus' name. Come on, let's celebrate our God right now because he is good. Let's praise him. Amen. Uh Just a little bit more. Just a little bit more. I'm so happy to hear people clapping and praising. Wow. It feels so good. You know, there's a verse that talks about Jesus said, of course, on this rock, I will build my church in the gates of hell would not prevail against it. And then there's another place in Revelations where he begins to describe the church. And he said that every nation, every tongue, and every tribe 
would begin to worship our God. How many of you are glad that that's the type of church that the kingdom of God is building? Come on. And I know we can't touch, but I want you to look at the person next to you, and I want you to tell them square in the eye, say, you are the church. Tell the person on the other side, you are the church. And we're going to celebrate it together. Come on, we got a new one for you. Ready? Ready, man? Two, three, oh! Put your hands together. There's a war raging. We stand united, we stand 
that you stand for justice and peace and victory for every nation, for every tongue, for every tribe. Thank you, God, that in these moments in your presence, there's nothing you can't do. You change hearts. You transform lives. Thank you that we are. Say this with me with your eyes closed. Say, Jesus, thank you that I am your church. Say, Jesus, your church is not a building, but it's people who are called out together to effectively change the earth. Thank you for using me and calling me your church. Do you believe that this morning? Thank you, Jesus. Yeah, come on, that's good. Promise me my 
Come on, you say something's changing. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I believe you, Jordan, to you say. Over disease, over fear, over hatred. Heaven come down. Sing it again. Yeah. Something's changing in the spirit. weekend coming up next weekend and we just found out that Macy's has decided to go ahead and have their fireworks all this week in different boroughs of New York with a theme and the theme is look up my friends we got to see beyond what it looks like because we see with the eye of hope we see with the eye of love and we see with the eye of faith Let's praise him right now one more time. Would you just lift up a shout of praise to our God and look up. Lord, we give you glory. We honor you, Jesus. Your word is alive. Your word is true. In Jesus' name, there's nothing too hard for you. Praise God. Amen. Well, look around at somebody and don't breathe in their direction. 
But look around at somebody and tell them, we're glad to see you on the Lord's Day, Sunday morning, live at Now Church, and you can be seated. Praise God. It's so good to be live on a Sunday morning. I'm telling you what, there's only so much you can do on Sunday mornings. Uh, for me, this has been the weirdest time for me because in my life, I got saved when I was about 19. And I can't remember uh, taking weekends off since I really got plugged into church. And so it's been weird to have Saturdays and Sundays but I think it was the mercy of God. Me and my family, we've, uh, we've lived that way. That's been our lifestyle, to put God first. And so that's what we're doing today. Um, we got a great new theme starting. I know no, we usually start the beginning of a month. We're starting today. A brand new theme called Let the Church Arise. How many enjoyed Pastor Lindsay's new song that he just birthed? They just wrote that. And they just birthed that, Let the Church Arise. And we're very excited about that. As we prepare to worship God with his tithes and our offerings, I want to just remind you of a couple of things. Diversity is not a new idea. Um, I just had to look on the back of a dollar bill, and I remembered E Pluribus Unum. E Pluribus Unum was uh, commissioned, by the way, on seven, in, in July 4, 1776. They put a committee together, which is always dangerous, and they put a committee together and asked them to come up with a motto for the United States. And that team took about six years to get something that everybody could agree on, or most people agreed on, e pluribus unum, a Latin phrase that means in many, one. In many, one. We were founded on diversity. It's in your money, and we're gonna keep standing for diversity because that's where God is moving. God is a colorful God, and God is moving in this time and reminding us how much he values the diversity that we have, not only in the world, but in this room, in this place, and I think you ought to give God a good hand clap for what he's doing to bring healing, to bring unity. You know, something bothered me about Sunday mornings uh, these past three and a half months. This is the first time since March the 15th since we've been here on a Sunday morning. We've been uh, do, using Friday nights as our, as our time the last few months and pre-recording stuff because all the traffic on the web was knocking churches off that we're doing live. We are ready now and we believe that we're up and running and everything's strong and we hope that we're coming to you strong where you are. But it, one, one thing that you get used to about Sunday mornings as a Christian is sacrifice. You know how many times uh, when you invite somebody to church, they say, well, uh, Sunday morning's my only day to sleep in. That's why it's a sacrifice. Everything begins with sacrifice. We say around here that there's no, we all need the glory of God, and there's no glory of God without true worship. There's no true worship without sacrifice, and there's no sacrifice unless it costs you something. And so there's something about being together as the house of God and bringing God our sacrifice of praise, but bringing our sacrifice of worship. Matthew 6 said this way from the Passion Translation. Jesus said, don't keep hoarding for yourselves earthly treasures that can be stolen by thieves like material wealth or toilet paper that eventually rusts, decays, or loses its value. Instead, stockpile heavenly treasures for yourselves that cannot be stolen, will never rust, decay, or lose their value for your heart. I love this the way it's put in the Passion. For your heart will always pursue what you value as your treasure. Your heart will always follow your giving. And you know, when you love someone, giving is easy. When you love someone, giving is the easiest thing because you just, you can't wait to bless. You can't wait to give. Let's worship God with his tithes and our offerings right now, whether you're here in the room or whether you're at home connecting with us still online. Listen, wherever you need to be, that's where you need to be. We are standing with you. We're doing everything to reopen safely. Uh, we were going to do children's church this morning, and with all the numbers that came out this week, we said, look, it's not wise right now. Jesus said, I'm going to send you out wise as serpents, harmless as doves. We've got to make sure that we're peacemakers, but we also got to make sure we're being wise with how we create peace and peace atmospheres. Let's worship God with our giving right now as we pray. 
Father, thank you. As we present to you our tithes and offerings, we ask you to bless your people, to pour out your spirit. We arrest this virus, this sickness and disease. We thank you, Lord, that you took it on the cross 2,000 years ago and you crucified on yourself every sickness and every disease known to mankind, not just what was alive then, but what was potentially alive through, the, through the, all of eternity. Father, you are our healer. You're our provider and our source. And today we worship you with that which is yours, our hearts, and that our hearts follow where our investments are in Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen. amen. God bless you as you give. Let's get right into the word of God today, the inerrant, the inspired, the infallible word of God. And as soon as service is over, uh, because we're doing a touchless environment in the room, we have baskets back there on the table where you can place your tithes and offerings at the end, or you can do it online, however you want to do it. I want to put three verses together as we begin to build a case for a brand new theme called Let the Church Arise. Isaiah 60 verse 1 says from the Amplified, Arise from the depression and prostration in which circumstances have kept you. Rise to a new life. Somebody needs to say amen there. Shine, be radiant with the glory of the Lord, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. For behold, darkness shall cover the earth, and dense darkness all peoples. But the Lord shall arise upon you, O Jerusalem, speaking of the church, and his glory shall be seen on you, and not only will his glory be on you and seen on you, nations or Gentiles or unsaved people shall be drawn, shall come to your light, and kings to the brightness of your rising. The glory of God in your life is like a magnet that attracts hurting and lost and broken people. And I'll tell you what, you don't have to look far to find hurting, lost, confused, or broken people right now. You don't. You don't have to look far. Psalm chapter 4, verse 1 from the Passion Translation. I was trying to pull this up a few weeks ago. It was in my spirit, but I found the Passion Translation is even better than what I was thinking. The psalmist writes, God, you are my righteousness, my champion defender. Answer me when I cry for help. For whenever I was in distress, you enlarged me. Whenever I was in distress, you enlarged me. I'm being squeezed again. Anybody, anybody feel like you're being squeezed right now? Anybody been in the squeezer lately? The Bible says it's God enlarging you, enlarging your capacity, enlarging your potential. He said, I'm being squeezed again. I need your kindness right away. Grant me your grace. Hear my prayer and set me free. Anything stretched is stretched for expansion. Finally, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 14, also from the Passion, says this. We appeal to you, dear brothers and sisters, this is the church, to instruct those who are not in their place of battle. Be skilled at gently encouraging those who feel themselves inadequate for the task or the time. Be faithful to stand your ground. Help the weak to stand again. Be quick to demonstrate patience with everyone. We're here today, this week, this month, these next few weeks, to instruct you to get back into your place of battle because the Lord needs you. Let's pray together one more time. God, would you open the eyes of our heart and let the word of the Lord come forth to change us from the inside, transform us, and help us to change the world. In Jesus' name, amen. My friends, this month we're talking about the power of God. Because no matter what you've felt the past three and a half months, we've not been powerless. I was thinking about this, I was telling our pastors in the back as we got together before church today. I was thinking about when Jesus sent out the 12 in his power to cast out demons in his name and to proclaim the kingdom of God everywhere that they went. And I was thinking about then he sent out 70 others also and sent them out two by two. And he told them, he said, don't prepare a lot. You don't have to take a bunch with you. You go and find the house, find the place, find a household 
where people are open. Find a son of peace. Find a divine connection. And go in that place and speak into that place and, and let that place, let your, your peace and your blessing now bless that place. My friends, when Jesus sent them out two by two 2,000 years ago, there were no vaccinations. There were no preparations. There was sickness and disease. It might not have been COVID virus. It might not have been corona. But there were sicknesses and diseases nonetheless. And Jesus sent them out two by two into every place where he himself was about to go. And he sent them to do the works that he does. He sent them to be his hands and feet. He sent them because at that point he could only be one place at one time. But they could go in his name. They could go in his power. They could go in his stead. And they could minister to people. And yet he told them to be spontaneous. Whatever rises up, you'll be there for the task. Whatever happens, you don't have to take a lot. You don't have to be prepared for a lot because when you go, I'm sending you and you have to be confident in that. My friends, we were born for adversity. We were born to rise up. And I tell you this, I was talking to one of our ushers recently, my friend Gary McCoy, and he said something to me and it, just, it was something that I just had been feeling in my spirit and then I heard somebody else say it, then I heard Gary say it. This is the greatest time to be alive in the history of the world. Think about it. Do you want to be alive at some boring, dull time when nothing happens? You want to be alive when, when they just kind of yawn through that time of history? You, th- we've had more adversity in the last three and a half months than we've had in many lifetimes. But we are rising to the task because God is not scared and he's not shocked and he's not afraid. He has prepared a people for such a time as this. It's crazy, it's unpredictable, but it's never dull. The Bible says you're a chosen generation, a royal priesthood. You're a holy nation. God's own special people, unique. King James says peculiar, but I didn't want to go there. And you have one purpose, to show forth the praises of him who called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light. You're a chosen generation. You think God is shocked at what's happening the last few months? (laughs) He's the ancient of days. He's the alpha and omega, the beginning and the end. He knows the end from the beginning. He already knows what's happened, and he already won the victory. In case case you've been wondering, we're in a war. And it's not a typical war between nations or terrorists. It's a battle for the soul of our country. It's a battle for the soul of our nation. And it's not even a battle with people or physical opponents. The Bible says that our people are not our problem. It's a spiritual battle. And here's the truth. Here's the interesting truth. The battle was already won 2,000 years ago. It was already won. You say, then why are we going through all this? Because the enemy, let me, let me tell you a story, and I haven't told this in years, but I used to tell it all the time. When we first started the church, another pastor in town had just started a couple years before we did and welcomed us to town, and we used to go hang out and have lunch back when we had time. And we would go to lunch like once a month. And this one time, we were, we were both living out in the shores and just renting places and kind of lived nearby. And my wife and I, we had one car at the time. And, and so uh, my friend said, hey, I'll, I'll pick you up at your house today for lunch. I said, great. So he came to pick us up in the shores. And, um, and when we came back from lunch together, we had a great time in God, just really encouraging each other. We came back to my house, he went to drop me off, and there was a snake about this long at my front door. And I said, oh my gosh, a snake. He, and he just followed me instinctively. We both got out of the car, opened the garage, I grabbed a shovel and a rake, and we grabbed that, we got that and kind of scooped that snake with a rake, and he pushed down on that, with the rake on the head of that snake, and then I just took the shovel and started chopping it up in little pieces. It was a pleasure. <laughs> the only good snake is a dead snake, to me. You can, you can like spiders and snakes, 
if that ain't what it takes. But it, that's another song. But it, you, you can like them if you want to. I, they're not welcome at my house. But here's the interesting thing. This is the God's honest truth. The head of that snake was cut off from the rest of its body, but it kept biting for about another hour. It kept biting and biting and biting. The kids up here are freaking out over here. I'm not, the snake isn't here. It's okay, guys. The point is that a snake in its nature will continue to bite even though it knows it's dead. And so for 2,000 years, the trick of the enemy has been to battle your mind and my mind as redeemed saints of God that have power and convince us that we don't have it. To distract us, to divide us, to confuse us, and to keep us from recognizing that Jesus already won the war. As the sinless son of man, Jesus hung on a cross. Jesus didn't come to the earth to be the son of God. He already was. He came to the earth to become the son of man, to identify with us, to live the perfect sinless life, to hang on a cross, taking upon himself all of the sin, all of the sickness, all of the disease, all of the poverty, all of the hate, all of the racism, all of the violence on himself. And it was crucified powerless. And as he hung on the cross, he said, it's finished. It's finished. No more would the enemy have a legal right to destroy the people of God. My friends, the enemy of your soul would love to hide Jesus' victory from you. But that's why the Bible says we cannot be ignorant of the enemy's devices. John 16, Jesus said this, These things I've spoken to you that in me, say in me, in him, in me, Jesus said, you may have peace in the world. You're going to have tribulation. You're going to have trouble. But be of good cheer. Be of good cheer. Put a smile on your face and be glad in your heart. Why? Because I have overcome the world. Jesus already overcame COVID-19 and COVID-20 and COVID-21. He already took it and crucified it. Matthew 28, he said this way, verse 18, Jesus came and spoke to his disciples, and that's you and me today, and said, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. You go, therefore, and make disciples of the nations. My friends, we've been given jurisdiction. Jesus said, I've been given authority, I've been given jurisdiction. That's what the word means. I've been given jurisdiction over all. If the word is exousia, I've been given power, I've been given authority, I've been given the governing right of the universe and over all of heaven and all of earth. He said, I've been given jurisdiction, therefore go in my name. Mark 16 said this, these signs will follow them that believe. In my name, Jesus said, they'll cast out demons. They'll speak with new tongues. If they drink any deadly thing, it shall not harm them. They shall lay hands on, their, on the sick, and the sick shall recover. And they shall engage serpents and cut their heads off. They didn't say cut their heads off, but I added that part. My friends, we have full authority. Our job is to enforce the victory that Jesus already won. That's what spiritual warfare is. Spiritual warfare is not trying to attain something that Jesus didn't already attain. It is about you and I stepping into a divine position between heaven and earth as intercessors, as believers, as worshipers, as praisers, as God's people, and stepping in there and enforcing the victory. That's why Jesus said, whatever you bind on earth will be, will be bound from heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed from heaven. We're supposed to be binding and loosing and we're going, what about this? What about that? What's going on over here? What about that? God is not the author of confusion. He's the author of peace. Who'd ever thought that 
being patriotic would be controversial. I just shake my head. This month we're going to talk about the fact that throughout history, oh, you can hear all kinds of stories on the news about how bad we've been as a country. And we have had some dark days, but let me tell you, if you are a student of church history like I am, you need to know this, that every time darkness rose and even leaders rose that maybe led this way or that way or the other way. It was the church of the Lord Jesus Christ from the founding of our country that began to do good things, that began to have good influence, that began to do great things. Heard somebody talk about all the atrocities against the Native Americans, and there were those things. Don't let, listen, we have some dark things in our past, so does every nation. But let me tell you something. God's people in those times, even from the time of the pilgrims, People like David Brainerd said, I want to be a missionary to those Indians and began to teach, learn their language, help them to develop an alphabet. The, the Cherokee chief developed an alphabet for the Indian, various, all the tribal languages. And the church of Jesus stepped up and began to minister life at great risk and great peril. Don't let anybody talk this country down. It's getting ridiculous. My friends, the Word of God says that demons are active in the world, but they are terrified of Jesus Christ. Not just nervous, not just anxious, not just depressed, but the Bible says that demons are terrified and scream out every time the presence of Jesus is manifested. And that greater one lives in you. And the Bible says, greater is he. Christ in you, the hope of glory. Listen, greater is he that is in you than he that's in the world. But you've got to see it. You've got to remember it. You've got to stand on it. You've got to stir him up in you. Because the enemy is pushing us down and trying to divide us and make us fearful and putting all these things down. Christ in you is the only hope of glory. The only hope for change. All around us, people trying to change the identity of our nation. Well, let me tell you who you are. You're a new creation. Old things have passed away. All things have become new. If you are listening and obedient to hear the word of God, to trust him as your savior and your Lord, if you're trusting God, then the Bible says you are the head and not the tail. You're above only. You're not beneath because of the Lord your God. Matthew 24, 12 says in the Passion Translation that there will be such an increase of sin in the last hours. There will be such an increase of sin and lawlessness That doesn't describe today. I don't know what does. There'll be such an increase of sin and lawlessness that those whose hearts once burned with passion for God and others will grow cold. My friend, the only way this world goes down, the only way this country goes down right now is if we go down. Is if the church of Jesus stays asleep If we stay in bed right now and curl up in a fetal position and suck our thumb and sing kumbaya, we're doomed. Because we are the only thing standing in our nation for real freedom. Not promised freedom. Not deceptive freedom. True freedom. The Bible calls the devil the lawless one. One translation calls him the anarchist. No government. Sounds a lot like the antichrist. Anarchist. All he wants to do is put out your fire. I heard a wise man say recently that the only way relationships break down is if somebody gets a hard heart and keeps 
hardening it more. The only way we lose, imagine that scripture, people whose hearts once burned with passion for Jesus begin to be icy, cold, hardened in their hearts. The love of many grow cold. We need to fall in love with our God afresh today. Because my friends, in this series this month, we want to remind you who you are. We're going to remind you you have all the power that you need because Jesus is alive. We didn't get Easter together a few weeks ago, so let's go ahead and say it now. He's alive. Amen. He is risen. Amen. That feels good. That's only three months late. He's alive. That's not a slogan. That's not just a saying. He's alive, and he's alive in you, and he's alive in me. And all we have to do is step into his victory. The world calls the church of Jesus a sleeping giant. My friends, if we wake up before it's too late, we will see. We will see. We will behold. Jesus said in Luke 19, Luke, uh, Luke 10, 19, I think it is. Behold, I give you power to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the powers of the enemy, all the powers of the enemy, all the powers of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means harm you. If, that does, if that's not real, if it's not true, then let's tear it out of the book. Because that promise is for you, it's for me, as much as it was for the early disciples. I give you the power to tread on demons. That's why a big part of the battle is for your mind, your focus. Why? Because the only place that God has allowed the devil to have a legal right to dwell is in darkness. If we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. In darkness... That biting snake keeps biting. That day that that pastor friend and I killed that snake, if we would have gotten too close to that biting head, it still could have brought poison. Poison was still, venom was still in its mouth. The power to lunge forward was still in its head, but it was dead as dead could be. The devil's been defeated, my friends. We used to do something in Bible school years ago where we just say, play this little, this little, this little uh, word game. And we'd say, okay, I'm going to say a word, and you say the opposite all at once. So let's do it right now. Okay, ready? If I say hot, you say? Oh. Very good. Excellent. Good, good, good. If I say left, you say? Right. If I say up? Yeah. God? Good. There are many new people that haven't been in my class. <laughs> Let me just ask you a question. Is the devil really equal and opposite in darkness to what God is in light? The answer is there is no opposite of God because he's incomparable. The devil is a fallen angel. His opposites would be Michael the angel of spiritual warfare, the God of the, you know, that the God is the God of the angel armies, the, that an angel called Michael, the Bible says in the Old Testament, is, the, is in charge. He's an archangel of warfare, spiritual warfare. Gabriel is an archangel of bringing messages from heaven to earth. Lucifer was the archangel of worship, but he committed high treason against God and lost his position. He wants you to believe he is equal and opposite in power and authority to what God is. And it's a lie. It's a deception. The Bible says that God, the God of peace, will crush Satan underneath your feet. That he didn't say his feet. Romans says that the God of peace will soon crush Satan underneath your feet. My old pastor used to say, if you want to send a message to the devil, you've got to write it on the bottom of your shoe. 
because he's under your feet. If we walk in the light, that means the only place the enemy can divide us is if, if, if there's sneaky, if there's, dwell, if, there's, if there's all this cloak and dagger. It's, it's the darkness that he rules, but not in the light. And you've never walked into a room and turned on a dark. In a dark room, you can light a match and it will be seen all over the place. Let's quit cursing the darkness and let's turn on the light of God. I read this powerful quote recently from Priscilla Shiro, a great intercessor. She said this, flaming arrows were not primarily meant to kill or destroy in ancient warfare. When they'd sent up the flaming arrows, you know, on those old, those old shows, those like uh, Braveheart, they sent up the flaming arrows. She said, they were not primarily meant to kill or destroy in the battle. They were meant to distract Your enemy wants to distract you so he can blindside you. And listen to me, she says. He is not indiscriminately shooting these arrows of his. He is tailored in his strategy. strategy. He's studied your tendencies and habits. He knows your deepest fears and weaknesses. And he's aimed at those areas in particular. He knows he can't destroy you. You're eternally secure in Jesus. But he fully intends to sidetrack your attention by setting any number of internal fires ablaze in your life like insecurity, intimidation, anxiety, worry, or busyness. He just wants you to be unfocused while he sneaks up from behind. The only thing the devil has on his side is thousands of years of experience of being an illusionist. Hey, look over here. Bam! It's distract to destroy but he's a defeated foe because the blood of Jesus Christ has set us free. And you have so much, you have so much as a church if you'll stand strong and stay united. There's more potential. In fact, untapped potential is one of the greatest tragedies on earth. I'll close with this. In 1895, Booker T. Washington delivered a speech in which he told a powerful story of a ship lost at sea for many days. The sailors on board this distressed vessel were without hope. They were exhausted from hunger and dehydrated to the point of death. Finally, someone spotted a boat far away and they sent a signal from the lost ship. Water, water, we die of thirst. The other ship saw the signal and signaled signaled back immediately. And here's their message. Cast your bucket where you are. The sailors were confused. Their signal was obviously being misinterpreted. They tried again. Water, send us water. They, they, They posted it, they sent it. They're desperate, they were dying. They didn't have anything to drink and they're men in the ocean, lost. The same response was delivered. Cast your bucket where you are. The men were beside themselves with frustration. We're going to die of thirst because these people don't understand what we're trying to say. Desperate, they signaled again. Same response. Then a fourth time and a final time. Same response. Finally, the captain of the lost ship said, I don't understand what it means. But we'll die if we don't do something. Let's try. So he took a bucket and he let it down into the ocean. And when he brought it up, the captain couldn't believe his eyes. The bucket was filled with sparkling fresh water. What he didn't know was when he got lost, they got lost near the mouth of the Amazon River, which deposits fresh water far into the ocean. What these sailors had needed all along was right under them. Their thirst was satisfied. Let me ask you a question today. In this room and for those of you in our online campus, are you dry and thirsty right now? Do you desperately need life? You don't have to seek comfort or satisfaction in another person. You don't have to try whatever the world says is going to fix all these problems or believe that there isn't a fix. Right here, right where you are, is a well of living water and his name is Jesus Christ. If you'll let down your bucket, 
You'll find everything you need. Every provision, every peace, everything your spirit, your soul, and your body needs is in Jesus. You have everything you need in Christ. You have all power. You have all authority. He gave you his power of attorney. When he said, in my name, he said, I'm giving you power of attorney. As I go to heaven and be at the right hand of the Father, I'm empowering my church with my spirit and with my name. Go everywhere and speak his name. Because wherever the soles of your feet will walk, he has given it unto you. We will not be torn down. We will not divide. We will not go backwards. We're going to let down our bucket one more time and get some fresh water. What do you need today? What circumstances are pulling you from your place in the battle? Let down your bucket. Surrender your heart and surrender your mind. Maybe you're here today. Maybe you're in the room. Maybe you're watching from your home. Maybe you're watching from a hospital bed. I want you to know God loves you. He loves you. And he wants to awaken his spirit in you. Maybe at some point in your life you've been fired up for God. The Bible says when lawlessness abounds, the passion and love anybody has can begin to harden and grow cold. Because we will look around and say, God, where are you? I'm waiting on you. And I want you to know today, God's waiting on you to be his church, to step into your position, to take your place, to trust in him with all of your heart. Would you bow your head and close your eyes just now for a moment? All over this place, all over this community of faith around the world, it's not time to keep questioning and freaking out It's time to look for the real answer that will never be found in man. Governments are limited, but there's no limitation with our God and he lives in you. Fear not, Jesus said. Only believe. Only trust in him. Right where you are, maybe you're feeling very stuck right now. We sing the song here all the time about the way maker. My friends, the way has already been made. When they got to the Red Sea, the way was already made. It wasn't building a natural bridge. It was God himself parting the waters and doing the impossible. Even when I don't see it, he's working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. What does God need? Somebody to trust him afresh. Somebody to believe again. Somebody to say, I don't care what they're saying on the news. I don't care what the symptoms say. I don't care what all these things say. I care about people. But I don't care about all the negativity and the lies of the enemy. He was defeated 2,000 years ago. And I just have to step up and take my position in the battle. The Bible says in Joel, the book of Joel, blow the trumpet in Zion. That's the church. Sound the alarm on my holy mountain. It's time for the men and women of war to wake up and to stand up to this foe in the spirit. For he is enough and more than enough. If you're here today or there at your home right now, you need to surrender to God. And you need to repent for the hardness of your own heart. The stubbornness of your own mind is what's keeping you bound and keeping you afraid. Holy Spirit, would you minister and move wherever the people are that are hearing the sound of my voice. Let your word 
begin to instill within us courage and strength and power and faith to believe for favor to encompass us about us with a shield. Thank you for your anointing, Lord. We pray for every person right now that is watching, that is contemplating, that is reflecting on this word. And we ask you to let your word come forth in power. Jesus, manifest your presence and touch every life. Maybe you're at home and you don't know him. Maybe you're in the room and you've kind of put Jesus on the, on the side chair. My friend, it's time to surrender afresh and it doesn't take a fancy prayer. It takes a yes. It takes a yes. You want to hear from God? You want to hear the voice of God speaking to you? God speaks to those people who are always willing and ready to say yes. Open your heart to him today and just say, Jesus, come into my life. Forgive me of my sin and my stubbornness and my fear. I don't know what's going on in this world this week. You know the end from the beginning, but I know you and I trust you. Help me to be who you called me to be, to make a difference in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let me just finish with this. It's time to stand your ground and take your place in battle. Whatever you need, joy, hope, strength, faith, peace, or courage, whatever it is, let down your bucket one more time because the rivers of living water are flowing. Undiscovered potential and power lies right inside you. Even in your darkest hour, you have access to living water in Jesus Christ. Let the church rise. Amen, awesome. Did you enjoy that today? Come on. It's good. I know you are glad that you came to church today. You go ahead and stand up. I have just a few things I want to make sure that I'm, I'm uh, bringing to you to remember um, as you leave, of course, as Pastor Richard said earlier, if you were at the point earlier in the service where you were ready to uh, give your offering and, and uh, we have that available in the back, ushers in the back there with the table you can give there. Also, don't forget midweek service is at Wednesday, 7.30. It is not here, it's on Facebook Live, but make sure that you tune in with that. It's gonna be really good. Also, follow us on social media because we're always posting updates about different services, so please follow us so we make sure we're staying all on track with everybody. Remember, we're going to continue to do social distancing outside if you want to hang out and talk with friends and everything. We've done everything so right so far. Let's continue to do that right. And our ushers will now step up in front. And they will release your row by row. Let's worship God right now as we go. There's a war raging, but you are in control. There are fire.
bless you. Have a great day. Thanks for joining us at Now Church. For the latest updates, visit us at nowchurch.com, including live or on-demand video, event registration, online giving, and much more. And don't forget to follow Now Church on our social media platforms, including Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. And please use the hashtag NowChurch. Thank you.